Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tana Bigelow. I'm a planner with uh, Parks, and I am happy to welcome you here. I appreciate your taking the time out of your afternoon to join us to uh, hear more about the Claremont uh, State Historic Site, Site Master Plan. Um, let me just do a couple of housekeeping things. As you can tell, you're muted when you enter the meeting. Um, the microphone is red when you're muted. Um, if you want to en enable the closed captions, you can click on the left side where the CC box is. If you want to type comments or questions in, use the chat while we're in the presentation. Um, and the presentation will be probably 20, 25 minutes at the most. Um, you're welcome to write your comments or questions in any time in the chat. Uh, so you don't forget them. Um, you can also, once we're um, open for discussion, you can use the raise hand icon to request uh, to speak. And we encourage you to do that. And if you need to leave the event, there's the red circle with the dot uh, with the X in it. And so you can just hit that and it'll ask if you want to leave the meeting. So, all right, so let's go to the next slide. So today, the purpose of our meeting is to provide an overview of the draft master plan and an opportunity for visitors and other stakeholders to ask questions and comment on the plan content. Um, we'll provide some background about the site for those of you who are new to Claremont or, or don't have a lot of familiarity. We'll go over some of the proposed actions that are in the master plan. Um, we'll explain the environmental review process that's part of the planning um, effort. And then we'll talk about what next steps are for finalizing the plan. Um, after that presentation, after the presentation, as I said, we'll open up the meeting for discussion. We want to hear from you. Um, and also note that the draft plan is available on Park's website. In yellow, you'll see the address at the bottom of the slide there. And it's also there are hard copies available at Claremont's Visitor Center. Um, at the park's Taconic Regional Office in Statsburg, and also at the Germantown and Tivoli Public Libraries. You go to the reference desk and they will give you a hard copy of the, of the plan, of the draft plan. All right, next slide, please. So we have a great group of people from parks that are joining us today uh, to help present and answer questions. We've got Susan Boudreau, who's the Claremont site manager. We've got Linda Cooper, as you heard, She's the Deconic Regional Director. We got Mark Hohengasser, he's our environmental analyst. Uh, myself, I'm a park planner based in Albany. And then on um, our panel, we have uh, a lot of expert uh, staff members here. We have um, Diana Carter, she is the Assistant Director for Planning and Programs here in Albany. Um, we have Bill Kratiger, he's Project Director, um, State Parks Projects with Historic Preservation. We've got Tim Dodge, he's Park Manager. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, park manager. And um, we have Kirsten Gustafsson, Gustafsson, I'm sorry, Kirsten. Um, and she is <clears throat> with also with Historic uh, Bureau of Historic Sites. She's um, the head of interpretation. All right, next slide, please. So I'd like to hand it over to Linda to uh, make a few opening comments. Um, go for it, Linda. Thank you, Tana, and welcome so much for joining us this afternoon to discuss planning for the future of Claremont State Historic Site. So as Tana said, I'm Linda Cooper. I'm the Regional Director for the Taconic Region, and there are 11 regions statewide, and the Taconic Region is one that reaches from sort of the top of New York City to the bottom of Albany. We have four counties, Westchester, Putnam, Dutchess, and Columbia County along the eastern side of the Hudson River. And some of you might have been in our sessions last May where we had similarly online sessions. We went into breakout sessions and we said, who wants to talk about education? Who wants to talk about history? Who wants to talk about the various facets of the plan and, and what might impact this historic site? So finally, we've now got a document that's pulled together and that is this, this uh, draft master plan that is in review and it's, it's an amazing amalgam of a lot of the history and the current and the forward looking for a, a place that became a historic site in 1962. It's mostly in Columbia County, as most of you knew, with a little bit of land in Dutchess County. 
and is designated, Claremont was designated as a National Historic Landmark in 1973. It anchors the um, Hudson River National, excuse me, sorry, my phone was ringing, Hudson River National Landmark District, which was created in 1990. And we, we colloquially call that the Great Estates Region. And, you know, if you think about going from Alana and Thomas Cole all, all the way down, there's so many, so many uh, places uh, of history along the Hudson and, and Claremont is, is a really good example of that. So anybody who has stood on the lawns, and we were, I was there yesterday, and it's just, you know, you stand there and you look out at the Hudson and you look out at the Catskills, we know that the, um, we know that, sorry, I did not know how to turn it to silent before I started, so it's, my phone is running on the side here. So we know that you, you see the Saugerties Lighthouse, you see the Hudson River, you see the Catskills, and you know that you're in a special place. So you have a special place, both physically, you have a special place with its history, and you have a special context in all of the all of the places along the Hudson uh, near near Claremont. So when we when we look at Claremont, we know that it's it really hasn't changed that much. I mean, this was the home the home of the last two generations of Livingstons were there in the early 20th century and. It hasn't changed very much from when they were there, and so we, our role is today and and this year has been to look at the property and determine how we should approach it, in its preservation, in its interpretation, in its landscape, and its visitor management over the next say ten to twenty years. A master plan is, has a, has has a certain amount of of time before it needs to be refreshed, and. We've done a lot of research and we have some new interpretation. And so we we are we are looking to create a more inclusive environment, more reflective of our multicultural past, and that's welcoming to all. And I think that's true of all of our state sites and all of our all of our parks across New York State. And we want people who are looking for stories, people who are looking for a, a place of respite, people who are looking for a place of rejuvenation, people who are looking to understand their place in history, to be able to do that by visiting Claremont, that that can answer, you know, meet so many different needs of, of our park visitors. So this afternoon, um, we hope that you'll learn a little bit about what is embedded in the master plan, in particular, sort of the key action items, and that You'll see how the input and the information that we've gathered over the last year um, has been put together to create what I would call a forward looking document. We hope that you will go find that document on the parks website and after you've gone through this particular introduction and to share to review it and then share with us your thoughts, give us some more input and reflection on the plan um, as it's drafted and before it's adopted. So we want to thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, and I want to turn the um, microphone as it is over to Susan Boudreau, who is the site manager for Claremont, who's going to pick it up from here. Thanks again. Thank you, Linda, uh, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're very exciting uh, time to share about this process, and I'll begin by telling you a little bit about the site background. Claremont has a complex and dynamic history, sitting on the eastern shore of the Hudson River. It exists as a unique cross-section of several North American narratives, representing countless years of indigenous history, the Northeastern gentry, the enslaved peoples of the North, and many more communities. Because of this complicated and rich context, the site offers its visitors a chance to examine American history with a nuanced approach and a comprehensive range of living and lived stories. When the site was acquired by New York State in 1962, recreation was the formal goal of the master plan. But when parks as an agency grew to encompass historic preservation in 1981, the focus at Claremont shifted accordingly, and the plan was updated in 1982. The last update of the master plan was made in 1993. But as you can imagine, 
in the 30 years since then, Hudson Valley, its residents, and the world around all of us has changed dramatically. The Livingston family was traditionally the historic focus of Claremont. Four years ago, Claremont joined the agency's Our Whole History initiative, which seeks to bring a more balanced narrative to public awareness, enriching both our state's history and the stories we share throughout all our parks and sites. This has been accomplished and continues to be accomplished through ongoing research and new interpretations. With this, we want to create a more inclusive environment and welcoming to all our visitors. As the Hudson Valley evolves, so should its recreation and the way it interprets its history. I'll now turn the next portion of the program back to our esteemed planner, Donna Bigelow. Thank you. All right, thank you, Susan and Linda. Um, so next slide, uh, yes. So a number of factors have determined the um, the need for a new master plan. As Susan said, the last plan is uh, about 30 years old. Um, also, over the last five, 10 years, attendance has been rising, and that means changing demographic patterns in the region are influencing the different types of activities that people are looking for, different programs, and different use of open space. Also in uh, 2024, New York State Parks will be 100 years old. And this means that um, it's, it's an important milestone, but it also means that our infrastructure is age, aging. And that's um, true of, uh, uh, of Claremont as well. Um, finally, climate, climate change impacts are increasing the frequency of severe storms. We have heat waves, we have less snow, and these things are impacting the site and will continue to um, impact. So we need to come up with strategies to address these kinds of pressures. Next slide, please. So a master plan looks to the future and it considers how to ensure that a park will be resilient and relevant over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, an important part of the planning process is to, in, is to create a vision as to how the site can best evolve for the future and future visitors. Uh, the vision statement that, that was developed for this plan is, uh, is up on the screen right now. Um, the Claremont State Historic Site will be a cultural, recreational, and, and natural destination that's accessible and relevant to all. The site will be a leader in visitor engagement and dialogue. It will reflect our diverse regional heritage and continue to develop our present and future role in the Hudson Valley using the site's historic context and restorative landscape. So a question that gets asked is, um, so what will change as a result of implementing the master plan? Um, actions that we've developed um, for the historic site are looking to find a balance between preserving the site and its elements, but also caring for the functional infrastructure and protecting the natural environment. So the plan ensures that the site will not be developed inappropriately or overdeveloped. It won't be developed piecemeal, it'll be a cohesive, um, uh, document that will move the site forward in a, in a planned way. Um, changes to infrastructure and site fun function are designed to improve accessibility, um, to create wider relevance and engage visitors with more of the site's resources. So what will change? We're gonna take a look at some of the actions that are proposed. First, uh, the natural resources at the site, um, the woodlands, meadows, and wetlands that uh, characterize uh, Claremont's natural areas are going to be healthier and more resilient. Um, during the development of the plan, a group of biologists, stewardship staff, natural resource specialists came to Claremont to participate in a one-day event with the goal of identifying as many plant and animal species as possible within an eight-hour period. Um, this survey is called a bio blitz, resulted in a, in a wealth of new data that helped inform the development of actions related to Claremont's natural areas. Um, uh, much of this data is also going to be included in the appendices, and you can see those. Um, it already is included in the appendices. You can see those if you look at the full document online or on or the hard copies. So New York State Parks is tasked with protecting and preserving the state's historic resources at its facilities. 
and many of these require really specialized care. At Claremont, a major project to refurbish the, ma the mansion's exterior was completed recently, um, and the mansion looks great, um, but there's much more work to be done across the site and also at the mansion in the, the interior. So the master plan proposes developing a historic structures report and a furnishing plan to thoroughly document, document and evaluate the condition of the, mat the mansion's interior and its contents. The comprehensive assessment of the mansion is really important since Claremont houses a large collection of furniture, art, decorative items, and most of these are original to the Livingston family, um, as well as historic materials such as wallpapers, textiles, lighting, uh, kitchens, and even plumbing fixtures. A furnishing plan allows for the authentic recreation of spaces as they were used, decorated, and furnished in the past. Um, and that helps to inform uh, authentic interpretation. Um, other historic elements in the landscape, such as remnants of tenant farm homesteads and agricultural structures will also be surveyed and assessed. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the Claremont site has much history beyond the mansion. The Errol House ruins, um, its historic cottages and the Red Barn all have potential for becoming more functional and active site elements. The Errol House needs to be stabilized and a plan will be developed to make recommendations on how best to accomplish that. Um, Sylvan Cottage, uh, as many of, of you are familiar, is de deteriorating and its location near the teaching garden is ideal for supporting one of Claremont's most successful school programs uh, called Harvesting History. <clears throat> the Red Barn is a significant historic structure. You see the picture on the right bottom. Um, and it's in moderately good condition, uh, but so with minimal repairs, the barn can become a multifunctional venue for seasonal exhibits and outdoor events. Next. So in addition to its historic value, Claremont also functions as a public park for recreation. Um, outdoor recreation here is, is uh, mostly passive recreation. People come to walk or to take uh, to watch a sunset or a bird watch or enjoy nature. Um, so proposed actions for recreation are in that same vein. Um, they are cr to create a clear, a clear trail access points with site maps, informational signage, trail markings, and to create a more legible and cohesive trail system. Uh, equestrian use is a historic activity at the site and there's potential for engaging interest groups by offering special equestrian events. And also a, a picnic area is going to be um, added at the ice pond to provide a scenic spot for people to gather. And this also helps to meet a planned goal to encourage visitors to experience more parts of the site beyond the historic core. So the National Park Service um, has reported a decline in vegetation in their parks among younger people over the past decade. And they've noted that the average age of visitors to its historic sites is around 50 years old. And this trend also affects the overall diversity of visitors. And at Claremont, while recent years have seen a significant increase in younger visitors, as new programs, exhibits, and events uh, geared towards a range of ages have been offered, this has helped to shift the de demographic. But going forward, the site will continue to develop content that reflects Parks Our Whole History initiative um, to help increase relevancy and offer multiple perspectives. Um, also, new interpretive material will be uh, developed related to the site's less evident historic and cultural ele elements that are found throughout the site and some of which have not um, been recognized for, for a long time. Next, please. So the planning process identified accessibility as a significant issue at Claremont. Um, there are steps, there are steep slopes, um, there are rough surfaces and a lot of other access challenges across the site. Um, the route from the main parking lot to the visitor center is not fully accessible. Um, providing access to more of the site is part of a larger effort to activate, activate areas outside of the historic core as well. So providing universal access to the mansion is a particular challenge. The mansion's main entrance has multiple steps and landings. And while there is a lift on the north side of the mansion, it's outdated and it doesn't provide a welcoming or equitable experience for visitors. 
in the mansion, restrooms, meeting spaces, and staff offices are not accessible either. So proposed actions, first of all, include a comprehensive study to assess accessibility across the site. Um, that was determined by the planning group as something that would probably need to be a professional um, would have to be brought in for that. So a consultant of some kind, um, because there are so many issues and it's complicated. Um, another proposed action is to install an accessible trail from the Errol House ruins to the on, in the southern section of the site to Claremont Cottage in the north. Um, and also providing an accessible route with clear signage from the parking lot to the visitor center. So this will improve pedestrian access. It'll also create more of a flow as people walk through the site. So during plan development, the site circulation was considered, the walkways, the roads, trails, carriage routes, um, and issues were identified for both cars and pedestrians. Um, some of you may have experienced how easy it is to miss Claremont's main entrance. I know I did the first time I went there. Um, so relocating the site's main access point will increase the site's legibility and improve safety for uh, drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists on Woods Road, which is now part of the Empire State Trail. Uh, the main parking area will be redeveloped with new pavement, green infrastructure elements, and clear markings for handicapped spaces pedestrian routes and drive aisles. Next, please. So a section of the plan proposes actions related to the site's infrastructure. Um, issues that were identified included the location of a public restroom, which is adjacent to the main visitor lot. It's a visual block for views across the Hudson um, and the building needs updating. The site has plans to relocate the restroom to the opposite side of the lot and um, to, at that, at that point, add an accessible and updated restroom when the entire parking lot is redeveloped. Other proposed actions include a universally accessible viewing platform to be installed in the footprint of the uh, restroom's former location that'll connect to the accessible trail that I talked about in the last slide. The visitor center will be improved with signage, paved walkways, and an accessible covered landing at the entrance. And an accessible interpretive trail is going to be developed near the mansion with an updated narrative that reflects uh, the, the state's our whole history and Claremont's larger story. So with increasing climate change impacts anticipated, uh, Claremont will also take a proactive approach to protecting its uh, historic elements, its infrastructure, and, the and its natural areas. In recent years, more frequent and severe storms have caused power outages at the site, which sometimes leave the, uh, the entire site without electricity, and it has sometimes lasted for days. Aside from the inconvenience in operating the site, this is a concern for the historic items which are housed there as they can be damaged by extended periods without climate control. Options for backup power at the mansion were also considered and the site uh, was considered um, how to address that as part of a New York State Parks initiative to generate 70% of its electricity from renewables by 2030. Um, uh, and then our um, staff from our Bureau, en Energy Bureau identified Claremont in, in their maintenance center as a, as a suitable location to install solar panels. So you can see the conceptual plan that is on the screen. I know it's kind of small, but as um, the panels are in the red bars and as shown, the solar installation, this number of panels would offset 100% of the site's energy costs. So a master plan also includes an environmental review. And for more on that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Mark, our environmental analyst. Hello. Um, so when a master plan is created for a park, it has a companion document that we call the Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS. In this case, it's in draft form, so we call it a DEIS. Uh, the EIS uh, provides analysis of all the proposed alternatives that we've considered through the process. And through that analysis, uh, we come up with what we call a preferred alternative. And preferred alternatives are all of the things that you've heard about in the, from Tana already that are included in the master plan. Uh, the EIS has a couple of different chapters which focus specifically on environmental review. Uh, first is chapter two, 
It's the uh, development of alternatives. And if you're interested in seeing all the other alternatives that we consider through the process, uh, and then the reasons why we either chose something or didn't choose something, uh, chapter two is a great place to start for that. It's kind of like a behind the scenes look at our planning process. Uh, we also have chapter four, which is the environmental impacts and mitigation section. Uh, this basically takes all of our preferred alternatives and analyzes them for potential environmental impacts. And it also develops strategies for um, avoiding and minimizing um, other impacts. Um, so once the master plan has been signed and is being implemented, we have something that we call the master plan consistency review. And that's basically just taking a project and uh, reviewing it and making sure that it's consistent with um, what we were proposing in the master plan. Because through the years, um, visions change, management changes, uh, priorities change, and sometimes projects change. And we just want to make sure that something that's being proposed in the future is still consistent with the plan. Uh, you also notice that in the master plan, there are some things that are um, conceptual in nature. We recognize that in advance, and we know that those will um, need additional environmental review to make sure that they are uh, keeping with our uh, stewardship ethics as an agency. So, um, so in the event that you want to take a, a look into uh, how we came up with the master plan, chapter two and chapter four are uh, great places to start. And with that said, I guess I'll turn it back over to Tana for the next section. All right, thank you, Mark. So we've created a, a timeline. Um, these dates may be adjusted, but it'll give you the idea of the next steps as we move forward on this. Um, as we mentioned um, in April, the draft master plan was published on the parks website. That was April 26. Um, during May, we have the public comment period. So that's what's happening currently. And this is sort of the kickoff for that. Um, and you can comment on the plan uh, all the way up to June 8th, and we'll give you some information at the end of the presentation about how you can do that outside of this meeting. Um, so revisions uh, will be based on public input as the plan evolves, and also we'll have additional internal agency reviews. And that'll that'll be sort of the what goes on in June, and then in July um, we hope to to receive uh, executive approval for the release of the final plan, and then there is a final comment period at that point as well. So there will be, as you can see, ad additional opportunities to uh, review and comment. However, I would say that this comment period right now is probably your best opportunity to provide feedback. So I encourage you, if you have thoughts or ideas, questions, please do um, let us know. Um, and then once we receive the comments, um, the content will re be revived as appropriate based on the public comments, the review comments that we get internally, um, and, and, um, and whatever. Um, and at some point when we finalize all of the, the comments and the public uh, information period, we create a chapter in the um, draft EIS um, that lists all of the substantive, substantive comments and then provides agency responses to them. So at, at that, I would like to go to the next slide and we can move to the discussion um, the section of the meeting. Um, again, you can. I see there are a couple uh, comments that have been written into the chat, so we'll, we will start with those. Um, and we also have some comments that were received that when you registered, they, there was a question that asked if there was anything you'd like to discuss, and so we'll go through those as well. Um, but I will start with one that we received in the chat, and it is as follows. Um, as you consider incorporating more of the history of the site, including tenant farmers, indigenous people, um, consider highlighting some of the historic structures that are not currently state or national sites, uh, such as the hamlet of Claremont has the original Montgomery home in Rhinebeck. Um, basically, there are other significant sites that are off the Hudson River that may be of interest to visitors. So would someone on our panelists like to address that? I can give that a shot. And you'll have to excuse me, I'm, I'm sucking on a cough drop right now, so I apologize if it, it changes the way I speak. Uh, my name is Kirsten, and um, I'm the head of inter uh, the interpretation unit up here for the Bureau of Historic Sites. Um, these are places that, uh, many of them are places that we are aware of, the Montgomery home in Rhinebeck, 
uh, the ruins of the Beekman home, also in Rhinebeck, Montgomery Place, uh, which is now on the Bard campus. Uh, these are places that that we know are in our history um, and are important to us. They appear at times in programming that are referenced in certain programming, but certainly there are a lot of opportunities for partnerships for anything that's open to the public. Um, and and I think I'm not uh, physically on the site anymore. I was there for about 11 years, but I think that the current staff uh, frequently has an interest in how to uh, leverage those partnerships to support the story and to include our partners. This is, uh, or include our neighbors. This is, um, we like to think that our museums aren't a competitive environment, that the more we work together, the more it's good for all of us to, to help each other out and be part of that big story that is Hudson Valley history. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, so the next comment that I see is uh, I'm representing the town of Claremont to see if there are any elements which we should coordinate with as part of current effort to update the town's comprehensive plan. Uh, can you think of any elements in the plan that which might affect or interact with surrounding town that we should be aware of? And then there's a little bit of a follow up. Uh, I might recommend that the plan include some idea to coordinate marketing with local tourism and hospitality venues in Claremont. Uh, for instance, wedding receptions, wineries, et cetera, which might help draw additional park and town visitors and benefit both. Um, can I, I'll take part of this and then anyone else can add on. First of all, welcome. I'm so glad you joined us today. I have uh, met uh, once with the planning um, committee and we're very excited that they are planning as well um, simultaneously. And we talked about trails, you know, connecting the trails um through the town of claremont from the empire state trail and how we might do that as well as possible uh, marketing or coordinating our events to highlight um you know events in the town as well as at claremont that we could mutually promote each other i think there is is more we can do and i hope to continue working with you all on that um i do think there is some of that in the plan um but I think that's an ongoing process that we will continue and hope to meet with your group again um, with the town board and, and the committee. And let me take a stab at, at some more of that. Thanks, Susan, and thanks, uh, Michael. I think that there's some, there's some great opportunity to coordinate with the town's comprehensive plan and to embed some of the sustainability projects that the, that the site is looking to enact as, as sort of a, as part of the as part of what the town's approach to sustainability may be and coordinate there and um, the public access aspects um, and the just just general park amenities can be incorporated at, as part of the the town plan as as a resource for for people within the town so it should definitely be included in the town's comprehensive plan as an asset um, that provides things for the community and I think uh, some of the some of the some of the natural resource and other aspects um, may be of use to the to the to the local plan as well and in terms of cross marketing we are all for it we would very much like to to build and um, coordinate collaborate and and co-brand as often as possible all right, thank you, Linda and Susan. I have another uh, comment here. Will there be any kind of a rating system in quotes in the master plan for the proposed projects that will prior prioritize certain elements over others? It would be good to know what are the most pressing items should the Friends of Claremont wish to seek funding from the Park and Trail Partnership grants. Um, so I can jump in on that one. Um, the master plan, uh, very early in the document, you'll see there's a chart that has um, a prior that has prioritized the projects um, uh, into time frames based on um, two year, five year, and ten year um, windows of of completion. And this, of course, is subject subject to funding and and um, schedules and and priorities that might change. But um, it's very clearly laid out there. So I would encourage you to take a look at that. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else wants to. Jump in on this one. 
Um, I will. So, Jonathan, thanks for the question. We, we definitely want to have grants melded with our action items. And I think that in that as friends, the friends are on this, you know, on, on this call, there are members of the friends group, Jennifer Hammerline Court as the executive director of the Friends of Claremont is a, is a close collaborator of the site. And I think as in working in conjunction with the site and discussing which priorities are attainable, affordable, and and meet meet a meet an action need. Um, I think they'll be able to come up, use the plan, and use the the system. Sometimes something may be a number one priority, but it'll be too expensive for the kind of grants that the partnership grants may do. So it may be something further down the line. But this will be a tool that can help inform those choices. And so long as they're made in collaboration with the site, there should be a um, you know it, it should run smoothly, but between the, the grant applicant and the site. The one thing we've been um, asking of all of our partners and friends is to do those things far much more further in advance than at the last minute from when the grants are coming in. So that if, if the determination is made, call it now, that this is that there's a grant you're going to apply for, that that grant application may not be for until next year, but it gives you an opportunity to flesh things out and understand exactly what's involved what's the capacity of the site to actually implement it and what will it really take um because what we're finding out sometimes people come in and they apply for something with one x dollars but don't realize there's more collaborative processes associated with the implementation of any grant so the costs may be double or triple what they're expecting and i i think that's um something for for anybody that's looking at an action item. There may be one action item, but there may be many more pieces of it to make it happen. All right, thanks, Linda. <clears throat> I have I see another comment in the chat. I um, I see that a midterm three to five year old goal is to assess the potential for physical shoreline access. That would be oops, sorry, that would be great. Scenic Hudson has done a lot of research about how other communities have provided access across New. Uh, high-speed rail lines such as Hudson Line South. I'd be happy to share the resources with you and encourage you to expedite the review. Uh, it may well be that the state still has public trust doctrine, doctrine rights to cross the river tracks there, the tracks there, um, unless the, these light rights were sold. Uh, and sort of a, a related comment, it would be great to reestablish the historic dot, dock where Fulton visited on his way to Albany. It's an important a uh, historic aspect of the site, in my opinion, has been overlooked. Uh, Tom, I, I saw a question in the chat that you skipped. I think did you mention the marketing, including Tivoli? Oh question? yes, I'm sorry. And, and and yes, of course. The answer is yes, of course. Yeah. So we would. Someone on the panel would like to address the um, riverfront access question. Uh, there, there are two parts of it. Again, I think because did you, Jeff Jeff Anzavino, thank you for joining us from uh, from Scenic Hudson. Jeff is the leading land use planner for for Scenic Hudson, and we appreciate his collaboration. There are two questions he has in here. One was to point out the viewshed um, project that was part of DEC. Parks was very active in the creation of that, and there's a link that Madeline has posted and Jeff has posted into the chat. So I just commend that to your attention, right? And then the shoreline access is a is a, is a project that, that Scenic Hudson has been um, looking into along our railroad corridors, both the two projects, one restoring the truss bridges and the other providing sh uh, shoreline access at at-grade crossings. At the moment, State Parks is not pursuing any at-grade crossings. Um, we, in, in, not at this site or at any other site, actually, and um, and until we know that there's that 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 can be done safely, it's probably not an, an area that we would be putting a lot of attention to in the short term. That's not to say that something couldn't come up in the in the future, whether it's bridging or some other way of creating access. And we know that there was access at one time. We know that there is discussion about whether or not you could create a dock and have the SS Columbia come up to this location. But at the moment, that would not be um, an accurate crossing at the site is not something we're actively pursuing. 
All right, thank you. And also, I wanted to note on that subject that we do um, discuss adding interpretation about the historic dot doc um, at the site. That we uh, that that is an important and probably underappreciated aspect of the of the site. So another comment um, asking about the relocation of the main park access drive. Is this a major uh, minor realignment for visibility or a more substantial relocation? I'll take that one again as well. Sure. We want to relocate that road. And have looked to identify some potential new entry points. We think it's dangerous both on in entry and exit. Shouldn't say that, but I mean, I think it's just hard. People miss it. And then when you're coming out, it's hard to see left. The sight lines aren't great. So I'd say that's one of our top priorities coming out of this plan. And yeah, we will and collaborate I, and we, with the county on that, I'm sure. Yeah, I think that we, we looked at a couple of possibilities and it will, you know, it's going to be um, somewhere in the vicinity of the original entrance where the stone walls are um, between the existing entrance and the stone entrance we would look for an opportunity to have a new entrance there and that would be also include um sign you know better signage it'll it, it'll not only be safer but it'll create more of an entry experience so people feel like they're they're entering uh, you know a different uh, place an era special place so uh so here's a comment uh claremont is such a blessing to the area amazing how many residents and people across the river don't seem to be aware of it for example has chronogram ever done an article about it that's a that's a great point I'll, um i can take that first of all yep. thank you for the lovely compliment and i live across the river so um i do think when we have done surveys um figuring out where our visitors are coming from um Actually, the other side of the river was number two after local communities. So we do believe that folks are coming over here, but I do think we, you know, we always want to bring more folks from uh, from that side of the river. Um, we have been written up in chronogram, but it is a good point. I would love to. Um, we were actually talking about doing some wedding things with chronogram again, and we are always doing interesting events. And with our whole history, I do think it would be great to do another article with Chronogram and some of the other local press have always been very kind to us. But again, thank you for your kind thoughts. And I hope that you uh, continue to visit Claremont. Okay, I have a note here from Carrie Watkins Bates, who's also from Scenic Hudson. And she says that she'd like to note that they hold, Scenic Hudson holds a public access trail easement on a property neighboring the Claremont site in conjunction with the master planning, it could be possible to activate this trail easement to expand the public access opportunities. That's great to know. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that, although our trails coordinator might be or Susan might be, but Carrie, thank you for letting us know. We'll look into that. Uh, just to, yeah, I would love to learn more about that, Carrie, um, and thank you for joining us today. I would love to learn more about that and, and talk about possibilities. I'll reach out to you offline. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see here. We have another comment um, regarding bicycle access. I know I've done some biking loops starting in Tivoli and hitting Claremont. It's a great place to picnic. I bet other bicyclists would also like to visit. Does the master plan propose bike racks or sharrows on the entrance road? Um, the, we do quite ha, have did a lot of investigation of the trails and bicycle access and that type of thing. And there are um, uh, proposed actions in the plan to create trailheads um, and possibly with benches and bike racks and, and other kinds of amenities for cyclists to encourage people who are coming off the Empire State Trail there um, to come in and, and be aware of the whole trail network there. Um, can I just make uh, add a comment here too? I think um, the Empire State Trail running right alongside Claremont has been a wonderful addition for cyclists. We are getting groups of cyclists we have coming um, that are letting us know uh, they are coming in small groups and large groups where they schedule for a whole month of they'll be here on Wednesday. We also have Parks and Trails New York. We're very excited. They're coming. Um, uh, with a group um, in the summer and we're very you know I think this has really increased our cyclist activity and we hope to do more and look to partner with other 
cycling groups, but I think, you know, the Empire State Trail is a, is a wonderful addition and, and a great opportunity for cyclists and a great place to do a quote unquote pit stop. Beautiful, have lunch, have breakfast, enjoy the view, use the facilities. I think um, people are taking advantage of that. Thanks. Um, there's a note that says rural intelligence is another media outlet that we could look at. Um, and then a note also that my wife and I love the cement pond. Um, and what are the plans for that? I don't know, Susan, if you know the, or uh, Tim? Yes, we call it, um, I call it the frog pond. Um, I think right now the Friends of Claremont and Jennifer is on uh, this call. So thank you, Jennifer, for supporting restoration of our gardens, including the Wilderness Garden, which has the pond. Um, and we are continuing to do a lot of work. We just worked on drainage this past year. Um, and so uh, we are continuing to do work in that area and the friends have been incredibly supportive, uh, contributing for three years in a row, a significant amount of money to get all of our gardens, the cutting garden, the wilderness garden, the walled garden, looking uh, so much better. And with our restoration of the mansion, we are really feeling it is uh, the Renaissance of Claremont and our new exhibit in the visitor center. If you haven't been to see it, I do hope you'll come and see that as well. But yes, we um, we don't have any major plans other than keeping the um, plumbing working on that pond and, and really act, you know, keeping the plant materials um, under control around the pond. So, but thank you. We love that as well. Kirsten Children, who is on the call, have been frequent visitors there as they grew up to our uh, cement pond. <laughs> Yeah, there are quite a few publicity pictures of my children pointing and catching frogs and which maybe we shouldn't be catching frogs, but sometimes it's hard to stop six year olds. <laughs> and a note from uh, one of the friends of Claremont, our garden, our gardener definitely cleaned out the pond and replaced plants with more historically appropriate and beautiful plants. So thank you for that note. Uh, posted that the executive director for the friends. Yes. Uh, so I, I don't see any more in the uh, comments in the chat, so I want to go over some of the comments that came in on, on the registration form. Um, can you discuss any proposed changes to the narrative for historical interpretation? Susan, you touched on that. Do you want to elaborate at all? Or Chris, Kirsten? I'm happy to talk about that. So uh, across the agency uh, for uh, the Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation, which includes 35 state historic sites, we are working to fill in the gaps that are part of our historic narr historical narrative and have been uh, for generations, really. Uh, when we look at the uh, presence of, of who was at our sites, we realize that for many years, uh, there has been a focus on uh, just a small fraction of the people who've uh, experienced our sites. Um, and we want to make sure that we're reflecting all of the experiences of our New Yorkers, whether they are indigenous, whether they are European descended landowners, whether they are tenants uh, who are uh, often European descended, whether they are enslaved or free Africans, uh, just to make sure that we're telling as complete a story and as complex a story as everyday life really is. Um, I think that kind of is it in a nutshell, but I'm happy to answer more if, if that's needed. I just wanna stress that it's it's not a, a replacement of our older history. That is, you know, of the history that's been told for many years. Uh, it's broadening and including because those are all perspectives that are part of what makes us, us. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, so, uh, sort of a segue here is um, someone had written in that they hope that we would acknowledge and educate about our impact upon indigenous peoples of the region. Um, and they mentioned the land back uh, movement and they provided suggestions for uh, speakers. Anyone on our panel want to comment on that? Kirsten, I answered it last night, but you're, you weren't on last night. Do you would, would you like to take this this time? So, although uh, Linda might be best uh, prepared to talk about the more present issues about land back and things like that, I can talk about our, our historical narrative. 
like I said, we're making sure that our history does not start with Henry Hudson anymore, that it reaches uh, further into the uh, enduring occupation of New York State by many peoples and many different peoples, including at, uh, at Claremont, um, and, and really reflecting all those stories in order to tell those stories right and the best way possible. We have been engaging uh, the inheritors of those traditions, talking to uh, present day uh, tribal entities. We speak to federally recognized tribes and nations across the country whose ancestry is New York um, and whose, um, whose uh, ancestral lands and, and homelands are in New York. That includes, um, in particular at Claremont for this project, we engaged the Stockbridge Muncie at other times in the Hudson Valley and in this area, we've spoken to the Delaware tribe and Delaware nation. And part of that is to go on stressing that this is, uh, these are people who are still here and to, uh, you know, this is an ongoing story and to make sure that we're addressing the perspectives of the people who've inherited these traditions, who've inherited uh, this legacy. Now it's you, Linda. I don't have anything to add. That's yeah, going that's... to add one thing. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, Linda. You're... Oh, go on, go on, Susan. I just wanted to say that also it was very important to us as we began to um, explore our whole history that we really had a strong advisory committee to work with us that represented um, community people from the communities, from the African American community, from the Stockbridge Muncie tribe that we had representatives on this committee to really talk with us about their experience in visiting Claremont and in visiting other museums and how um, this was perceived in the community. And I think that was really important to us. And then what would they like to see? And then they were reviewing every um, piece of information, every panel that we did. Um, and we're working on the tour and doing the same thing with our tour, the new tour for the mansion. I think it's really important that we are not creating these in a void. I should also add uh, that we have that the Bureau of Historic Sites, which advises interpretation for all of our state historic sites, uh, has been lucky enough to recently uh, over the past six months bring on an interpreter of Native American history. This is a woman who is uh, Tuscarora and brings to us just really a wealth of understanding about how to frame our perspectives, how to reach out effectively and really work um, effectively with present day uh, tribes and nations and really make sure that we're doing this um, in the way that, that people want to hear about um, who and want to be spoken of. All right, great, thank you. Uh, another note in the chat, um, as a nod to veterans, Claremont Academy has a full listing of those who joined the military as town of Claremont residents. The largest contingent is from the Rev Revolutionary War. Also, any thoughts on a discussion of the Calico Wars slash Rent Wars um, as a response to current discussion of fair housing? Certainly the uh, Rent Wars uh, and, and the Calico and Tin Horns uh, story that, that has been told in a number of different ways um, is part of our exhibit. Um, and you can see that if you visit the visitor center. Uh, so it's front and center. It is part of that. Um, and, and one of the things that New York State interpretation has been working on doing and what we've been doing trainings on um, is exactly what uh, you brought up, Mary, which is um, bringing relevance to our historic subjects by bringing them forward and looking at how they look at today. So just that sort of, well, here's the rent wars and people are looking at um, at the fairness of their, their housing arrangement to today. So creating opportunities for that dialogue is part of the ongoing uh, interpretive goals of New York State across the agency. All right, uh, a little bit of a pivot um, to a comment that asked if we could discuss the, any impacts of increased tourism on the site. Susan, you want to take it? Sure, yes. Um, first of all, I think that we're very excited that our numbers currently are up. Uh, 
Many people found us during the pandemic. We were a place for rest and relaxation. And um, I think that many of those people have stayed with us since then, um, local and people who moved up here during the pandemic. So we're very excited about that. We also have taken a note over the years that our visitors are not like a lake or a um, some other parks in the in the region where people come in the morning and they stay and swim all day. Claremont typically people are here for two to three hours, maybe four hours, have lunch, take a walk, walk their dog, read a book, um, and then leave. So that we have a turnover that some of the other parks and uh, particularly parks don't have. So, and we also have 503 acres. So people are pretty well spread out. And in the plan, um, we've also made a note about moving, uh, spreading our population out so that they are beginning to explore and work on and be in the northern end, which is a beautiful um, part of the site, the northern end of the park. And by moving our entrance as well, I think that will also increase uh, people um, coming to that end of the park and by doing some other um, uh, actions to activate that part of the park. I do think we are monitoring our attendance. I think we have a ways to go before we would be in that, you know, in that position. But we always, we are, you know, we keep a close watch on our attendance and who's attending and how people are utilizing the site. All right, thanks, Susan. Um, so uh, speaking of the northern part of the site, um, someone would like us to comment on um, the condition of Sylvan Cottage. It's fallen apart. So uh, we, we've tried over the years to to um, stabilize it internally. We jacked up part of the part of the floor and the walls to see if we could get it stable. We've looked at it as an education center, as possible classrooms, as restrooms, as a as, as possible staff housing. Over the years, it's it's a building that we would love to restore. It's just a matter of funding. Thanks, Linda. All right, I think that's all I have for comments. So, anybody else have um, issues or or things that you'd like to bring up? If not, I will ask you to move to the next slide. And note that we are having our comment period. Um, through June 8th. The, the, the email address that you see there um, is the best way to probably to submit a comment. You can also send a written comment to the address uh, to my attention there. Um, this, these two meetings, the one that we had yesterday and the, this one will be, have been recorded and they will be uh, posted on our website um, where the same spot that you find the master plan. And so that's on our New York State Parks website. Um, so with that, I will like to hand it over again to Linda to make some concluding comments. Really, we just want to say thank you. Uh, Claremont is a special place. We love it. Um, we're glad you love it. it. It's so nice, you know, Will Tatum, and see, see you joined us. And it's nice to have the Duchess Historian and yesterday, last night, Lisa Welbeck from Columbia Historical Society joined us to have to have scenic Hudson on the local town on the the you know planners, it's um, it's heartwarming to us because we really would like your input. Um, Tana is the major author of our of our document and did incredible work on it, but it's a huge team uh, or a pretty large team of, of biologists and and archaeologists and um, architectural conservators and other people, environmental analysts. You know, staff members, planners that had input into this plan, uh, as well as obviously public input. You know, when we've had uh, last May, we went out and had some public meetings and um, online meetings, and and have have been working with the friends as well. So it, it you know it, it takes all of us to vision and to have a to come up with what we can what we think we should do, and and then we start to work with what can we practically do, but we didn't limit that. We looked to see what we think the future of Claremont should be and how how to make it relevant in today's times. And 
you know, whether that's through programming or through infrastructure to make it more accessible or to make it more bicycle friendly or whatever, th whatever that may be, or to protect the environment or to make a path that we found that during the pandemic, this site was just a respite. It was, it, 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 it was a salvation for so many people who were able to come and just walk outside in its peaceful environment. And it is a link um, between several communities right there. And it, it's just a special place as I continue to say. So we thank you for your time, for your comments, for, for hopefully your reading of the plan and, and giving us more feedback as you think of it. And I wanna take an opportunity to thank all the team members who were on the call, who worked a great deal um, under the leadership of Diana Carter, uh, who's also on the call, who, who's really um, oversees all of our master plans. So we're really grateful for the team that we have um, to be able to produce a document like this. So thanks. All right, thank you everyone. Great comments and have a good afternoon. Thanks very much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you everyone.